Welcome to the Starting Word Podcast. I'm your host, Edward Sheldon, a.k.a. Dark Logos, and this is the show where we look at the strategies, tactics, and mechanics behind the game of Heroclix. Uh, today, it's something a little bit more abnormal on this show. Someone else is on the show, uh, and uh, we're going to uh, do a couple of things uh, today, and uh, most important thing is we're going to talk about the new power rankings on uh, Clixed Off. I also I have uh, with me today... Uh, none other uh, than the uh, the Facebook streaming personality, Aries Edge. Say hello to the nice people. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, I, after listening to uh, 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 him on uh, Majestics and a couple other live streams, I was like, hey, maybe I should have this guy on. <laughs> and we can talk about, you know, the game. Because I think uh, having good people to talk about the game with is just as important as watching good games and playing good games. So um, let's let's sort of go ahead and get into the power rankings. So uh, you are one of the people that voted in the power rankings, and I'm one of the people that voted in the power rankings. I sure. Just yeah, just to so that folks know, like none of this is like salt. Uh, none of us are like, oh hey, look. We're not a part of this. Like, for full transparency, uh, both of us are uh, a part of this uh, list from the voting panel. So, uh, I, I don't know. Do you still have your voting order? Like, uh, I'm trying to pull it up right now, actually. Um, okay. I do have my voting order. I'm just trying okay. to go back through where I sent it and all that good jazz to find out what my voting order actually was. Okay. Yeah. Because oh. see, for some reason now, oh, there we go. Okay, I don't see more. All right, I clicked it. All right, because before I couldn't uh, see people. So let's let's start off at the ones receiving votes, but not on the list, mainly because I'm on it. And I just wanted to say shout outs to whoever voted for me. Thank you. You you believe more in me than I I believe in myself. Uh, <laughs> you you believed in me that didn't believe in me. So thank you very much. Uh, Paris Gordon's on there. That's understandable with things going on in his life. Okay, uh, so just letting folks know, I voted for uh, DJ Riggin. Uh, he he's listed as DJ Riggins, uh, but anyway, anyway, so I I, I voted for DJ Riggin, uh, and I think I, I think that's the only other person that I have that got voted for that I voted for that didn't make the list. Uh, Paris Gordon, I, I believe, is a good player. DJ's a really good player. Uh, Pedro, I think he's a big personality. Uh, and I, I think Married with Clicks has helped Pedro like sort of come onto the scene. Uh, Abdul is on the list uh, of, you know, notable, but hey, you didn't quite make it. Uh, I don't know the Steve DiCarlio. I'm sorry. I don't know you, homie. Uh, Michael Love, that's more of a click stuff uh, uh, in, uh, I would say, sh uh, shots fired, click stuff area type person. I mm -hmm. I've heard his name more on those shows. Matt Esbrook is, uh, I think it's, is that Clicksman, might, at Matt Esbrook, or is that four points? Cause there's, uh, it might be Clicksman. It's not four points. I don't think it's four points. I forgot that guy's last name. It sounds like the same. Anyway, uh, I, I got crap from them on that. <laughs> I mentioned Scott, Ed, and Isaac, and I forgot the fourth guy's name because he doesn't hardly do anything but championships. And they said they call him legends now. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, Randy Carter, which, all right. And I'm not trying to throw shade, but. I, I could see how he some people would vote for him, but I haven't seen him do enough on the scene. Aaron Cantu, that makes sense. He pretty much has performed really strong on the West Coast. Sam Powell, she's also done really well. Wes Summers, uh, I also think is sort of is is justifiable considering that he's he's a pretty good player on a on a top ranked team. So what what are your thoughts on the uh, didn't quite make it list? Uh, I mean, there are people that I had higher that fell lower. Like, I thought Matty G would have been higher because uh, I had him higher on my list. Um, I had Micah on my list. 
Uh, he's he's performed well. He's won a couple of uh, some uh, big events. He placed what was he top eight or top sixteen at nationals. Uh, he wasn't able, I think, to go to Rock Cup, but uh, he's been consistent, and that's a big thing with HeroClix. You got to be consistent. Um, I had Paris on my list. He was uh, 14, uh, just because again he he couldn't make it to nationals. But again, he's he's someone who is always in conversation. He's always um, he always performs when he goes places, and again he bounced back, um, winning in the team event at Rock. And then also placing, I believe he was top eight or top 16 as well. Um, Abdul, he finished second at Nationals. Uh, again, uh, wasn't able to travel to The Rock. He'll, I'm sure he's going to have a good showing at Worlds, but he was on my list too. Um, I mean, again, but it's, it's a lot of these, when you go from probably, I don't know, 10 down, it's anybody in that section can be bounced around. A lot of people who made it could have been honorable mentions, and people who are honorable mentions could be in those slots. Um, and then at the top, too, I mean, you, you could switch even a couple names around around there around, too. Um, okay, and, and, and this is something I, I sort of wanted to get into. All right, so we'll, what we'll do is we'll go over our list first, <laughs> and then we'll look at the official list because I think we're going to see some disparities. Uh, and I'm, and again, I want to make it clear. I'm not casting shade on anybody's votes. I'm not saying there's any collusion by lane. I'm not saying any BS. OK, I'm just ta- I'm, I got two voting members here. There's us two. We're just comparing lists because I know there's the dramas in the street right now. I'm just saying, OK, I, I don't want anybody thinking like I'm up there trying to start stuff. So it's one of those won't start none, won't be none. Okay, so top of my list is George Massu. Okay. Uh and, and again George? I had George number one. Now now here's the thing. Lane specifically said active this year. Yes. Okay. And that is a and is an active player. Okay. So there's some people that uh, automatically could not be on there because they're not active. Like this isn't this is not a all time list. This isn't to trying to decide who's the goat. Okay. No, this is a rolling like uh, what they do in college football. It's yeah, a, yeah. It's a week or in this case, I think he's doing it quarterly. So it's going to be like a quarterly to quarterly voting process where you take everybody's stats and what they've done over that process uh, and you rank them on how you think they're performing. It isn't an all time yeah. list. If it was an all-time list, it would be a lot different than it would be. It would be completely different. Absolutely. Yeah, I I would make it I would make it blankly clear. As much as I love PJ and Matt, on the all-time list, they're not they're not top five. No. Like they don't they don't have enough history to be top five. No, you look uh, at you look at multiple world champions. You look at multiple yeah. national champions. I multiple mean, was the world like champions. Ed and Scott Crampton, who, who were just running through. Uh, Wizard World tournaments back in the day. Like, yeah. yeah. Even that into consideration before they had the national and worlds kind of system, they did the Wizard World circuit, and those guys were winning in those hand over fist back then. Right. So, again, like I said, is, and, and again, folks, you don't, that, folks been salty lately. This is not me casting shade on, on anybody. I, I think this is as innocent as it is. But uh, so just giving everybody pretext of why the list is the way it is. OK, so I have George Masu. OK, I had to drop Pat. OK, because, again, he, he made it clear that it was active. And I thought Pat retiring was just a running gag. OK, so because he goes to events, he plays against one of my guys in Arizona periodically doing WKOs. So, again, I thought this was a gag that Pat runs like I'm retired. You know, like, haha, you know, I, you know, what's uh, Goku's trainer? Like, not Kami, uh, Master Roshi. He's freaking Thank Master you. Roshi. You know, <laughs> just, just sitting there with his turtle shell, sitting on his island, chilling. You know, like, that's how I looked at Patrick right now. Okay, so then I had Dan Powell, and I told, I told uh, Lane, just move up everybody. So I have technically Lane, uh, Dan Powell's number two, uh, PJ's number three. Eastern Brock's number four, Scott Crampton, number five, Isaac, number six, uh, Ed, number seven, wow. Kenji at eight. Folks sleep on Kenji. Kenji's nope, that's, that's the same spot I have Kenji. 
Yeah, Kenji would be number eight, Dustin Sears number nine, Adam Friedman number ten, Matty G a number eleven. I know some folks would be like, you hating on your boy, but if you look at everybody above him, they have titles. Like not hating on my boy, but everybody above him on my list has titles. Okay. Uh well, and then I have Howard, but again, I was told he retired. Uh then I have DJ Riggin, J Major. And since I was told to take out Howard, I had DJ move up, J Major move up. Uh, and so to replace uh, those two, I put in, um, hold up. Okay, I put in Tom Kerr and then Lane Miller as last. And, and then, again, I, I, I believe in my order. I wasn't trying to blow smoke up anybody's butt. Or try to, you know, pander. This is before all the dramas hit like a 10-ton brick. So I, I do believe that Lane is the top 15 player. Uh, I don't think he's a top 10 player. That's my opinion. But again, that's my list. Uh, my, only, my only contention on that, and again, not stirring the pot, is I want, I see Lane perform well. I want to see uh, Lane sort of come out the box and see if he can, like, knock Dan out. It, or or better yet, do something that's not mimicking Dan. So, like, Dan's playing something, he's playing, uh, Lane's playing something else. Again, that's not a bad thing, and I'm not telling Clickstaff how to run their house. Uh, but I think that would be something to distinguish himself from Dan just a bit. Uh, but that's my opinion. It's not something they have to do. It's my opinion. So with that, Mr. Aries Edge, you're my guest. Go ahead and feel free to pontificate on, on your list. Uh, yeah, I wasn't really going to go um, and throw my list out there, but I, I'll throw it out there. I don't care. I, I'll back up everything that I have on there. I put Isaac uh, at number one. Fair. Just because – and I'm just going off – and again, I'm going off of the criteria that Lane threw out there. We need to – this quarter or for whatever time period we're going by, I'm I think that nationals is a much bigger event than Rocktober, than Canadian nationals, so on and so forth. So that's why I have Isaac at one. Uh, okay. On top of the fact that he was also what top eight at Rocktober as well. Um, he won a Rock Online event, I think too. And he, I mean, anywhere he goes, he's always going to be a contender in anything that he plays in. And I just think nationals is a bigger uh bigger stage than what rocktober was because even they said too that their numbers were down this year and it wasn't yeah. as big as it was last year um i put dan at second because he does he is consistent and people will uh people they root against dan because they don't like his play style and that's what it boils down to and and when you look at it, the numbers don't lie, wins don't lie, things like that. I also put out a a write up as well about um, the top five teams going into um, the world's tournament coming up, and I I got a lot of feedback from people who are upset because I didn't take super qualifiers and some Wiz Kids Opens into consideration. I just took the big ones into consideration because you see that some of these super qualifiers are being reported that there's 13 people. So it's kind of hard if I if I want a 13 person event and then someone else places like top three, top four in an event and there's 30 people there. Like, how do you weigh those out? Like, especially if I'm going against like top tier guys in my 30 person event as well. So it's, it's I, hard to 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 balance those, you know, real brief side note on that. I was talking to Patrick about that and I said the, the biggest thing that I feel like you can balance the the actual competitiveness of the event is are there at least three team rep three teams represented represented or there are 20 people mm -hmm. i i think if you because the biggest thing about big tournaments is you have a bunch of chaff fodder that inflate the numbers and so when you get rid of the chaff fodder if you hit like 20 30 people and it's chaff fodder then okay yeah that you went through enough field to actually get to the good people mm -hmm. but if you are saying like hey there's 14 or 15 people and there's you know three different teams represented and every team's being bringing their best players that's a more serious tournament um 
And so that's I think that's the problem with looking at events now, because I think size of venue or size of the event does not judge the quality of the event. But at the same time, if it's just like Phoenix Nest shows up at a random WKO and we get first, second and third, does that mean that that was a serious event? No, it's good for us if we're the only team there. But, yeah, you, you can't be, you know, wagging around and being like, yeah, we number one, we the best. When there was no serious like competition or at least recognized competition, well, yeah, but I apologize. Apologize. Go ahead. No, well, that's what I, that's what I said, and, and I think the the podcast with, with Pat too was that like you know how how do you rank it if you go to a thirteen person tournament and six of the people there are your teammates? Like you're bringing fifty percent of the playing field with you. So that, so, but again, Dan has performed well at last year's Worlds, Nationals, Rocktober. Uh, he's won uh, back-to-back rocks, um, and he's always probably top four, top eight, top 16 at a Nationals, Worlds, whatever the case may be. Uh, I put P.J. Bolin at third, uh, Canadian National Champion. Again, National Champion, Canadian National Champion, uh, and he's always performing well. He went out on the Majestics, uh, the rock events out there out west, and he won an event. So he'll be playing in the, uh, the Majestics uh, finals coming up. I think it was at December 8th. I think that is the weekend after Worlds. So I put him at three. Uh, I put Tom Kerr at four uh, just because he's, he's playing at a high rate right now. He, right. Uh, yeah. Right. He, he, he was, what, the final, final table at Rock and Canadian Nationals? Uh, he was a final table at Rock Canadian Nationals, if that makes sense. He was at yeah. he was table at Rock Canadian Nationals, and he was also a finalist at Rocktober. Right. Played Dan. So he's he's been at a lot of final tables. Right. A lot of championship tables. So I put him at four. I put Easton at five. Uh, I put Matty G at six. Uh, I had Dustin Cedar seven. I had Kenji at eight, the same spot that you had him. Yeah. Um, I had Lane. I had put Lane at nine because he's, he's, like I said, it's about consistency, and Lane has been consistent. Lane uh, has put in work. He has. Uh, again, though, like you said, too, um, maybe varying up teams, something like that. But again, numbers don't lie. Consistency doesn't lie. And he's in a lot of top fours, top eights when he's, when he's playing. Uh, I put Pedro Roca at 10. Again, he's a, I think he's a multi-time national champion now in Brazil. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and from what I hear, he's coming uh, to worlds this year as well. So I'd like to see what he does there. Yes. And then people, I, I do not sleep on the Brazil team. I said this more on when I did the core. Pedro are legit, man. Yeah. Like the, the, the international players that come to America, they are, they are bringing a host of stuff you've never seen. Mm-hmm. So you, you can't sleep on them. Even the Mexican uh, crews, when they come through, mm-hmm. like they're bringing an unknown meta. And, and I know that folks will be like, but we know the best stuff. no, we know the optimal path. We know the path of least resistance due to money. Yeah, we have and more options. It, yes, we know that we we don't know the path of least resistance with struggle or the path of most resistance. And the path of most resistance can make monsters. Because when you're desperate and you're trying to figure out how to beat stuff, you have to think through a lot more. So I, they work harder because they have they don't get as much product. I mean again a lot of people have complained about how we don't like all the other national events had gotten their star rows and this and that, but this is like a first time that this has happened for those guys. So they've gotten something like star row in their hands before us for the first time in a very long time. And I mean, I give them credit. I mean, they're usually trying to just, you know, get whatever they can as again too. I think they get like their releases months after we get stuff. So we already get like a re- a release and they're still waiting for their product to get, over to them in some of these countries so in a sense we're kind of spoiled in a way where i mean yeah the secondary market kind of sucks to get stuff on especially if it spikes because it's good but a lot of times we're getting stuff in our hands and these guys still even haven't cracked a booster yet right um so after that i had george at 11 um again he's uh he played uh, he won the u.s uh rock championship over on the west coast there uh, and yeah, I think he is playing in the finals uh, as well, coming up after Worlds. Um, 
and again, any tournament that George goes to, you know he's going to he's going to show up. He played something out of the box at Nationals, and I think he missed the cut. He was playing a uh, a Green Arrow team there. I think I right. saw he played a, a full point. He played against a full point Gobble King on stream, and did really well with that team. So I put him at eleven. I put Abdul um, at twelve. Uh, again, a consistent player. He plays second at uh, Nationals. Uh, I put Adam Friedman at 13, and then I put Paris Gordon at 14 and Micah at 15, just for the fact that uh, Paris had an off year, and uh, I I picked him to, to win nationals, uh, and then he kind of screwed me and didn't even go to nationals. So I, <laughs> I, I should have messaged him about that. I was like, hey, thanks for that, man. And he's like, I got stuff going on. And I was like, yeah, we all do. I mean, I understand it. So I was, it was good to see him uh, go to the Rock. And uh, he won the the was the critical uh, clicks event. He won the uh, the team event, and I think he was top eight um, for the main event. So I mean, again, for a guy who took off basically a, a big chunk of this year to come back and perform like that in an event, I mean, good for him. And like I talked about it before, Micah has just been uh, consistent, pretty consistent this year. And for a young player too, I like it. It's got to be hard for Isaac. And, and Micah and stuff to even, like, get out to these events, especially Micah, just for the fact that, like, he's not, like, Ed is still very big in the game, so him and Isaac traveling together and stuff like that, it's great. But Micah, I don't think, like, he just shows up and he still does good. Mm -hmm. My honorable mentions, I had Tyler Spees, I had Jay Major, Steve DiCarlo, Scott Crampton, and uh, Aaron Cantu were my honorable mentions. Just that That's fair. Like, again, I I said it, you know, on Majestics, and it's not like to throw shade. If Tyler Spees can prove to me that he's a good player mm -hmm. without playing Wales, then yay. <laughs> I, I, will, I, 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 would, I would put him up there in, like, watch this cat status. But my problem comes in is if you have something, and again, again this applies universally. This applies universally. So folks will be like, I, I love some whales. Catch me outside. But 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 for real, if if you as a player are dedicated to saying like, all right, I made this famous and you did make this fame, you did make whales famous. Great. You made whales famous. Now, what what else can you make famous? And you're like, well, I've been successful with whales. I'm going to keep going until it retires. OK. So in that meantime, if if you make your team a gatekeeper team, how can I judge your skill level? Like realistically, like if if you're only playing one team, how can I judge your skill level? If if you come out, it's like I played Wales plus I played Unimine. Uh, I I did well with both. Well, uh, did not well. I did well with both. Then then I'm like, okay, cool. Now I have a, a justification to say, look, Tyler Spees has the skills to pay the bills. But right now I have to set, sit back in analyst mode and say, he's a good player. I'm not salty. I'm saying this honestly. I think he's a very good player. I do believe though, that he needs to show me that he can do a lot more. And in particular, like I give Lane some props on this. He has played different teams. You know, he's played, you know, mine. Uh, he's played Starro. He's played uh, X-Men. Uh, he, he's played a lot of stuff this year. And I feel like he's proven that he can top with multiple things. But you really started hearing Tyler's name when he started promoting the whales. And if you take the, the absurdity of what people thought about the whales initially, mm -hmm. you take that away and you, you take away the fact he's on click stuff, does anybody really know him as a player? No, they know him as the Wales guy. And and that's something that Dan had to fight because Dan had to fight fight just being known as I won with Unimine. And it's taken Paris a long time to fight being known as I am uh, the Faust guy. Mm -hmm. So so but like, again, I, again, I'm not pulling this out. Like, for instance, I'm not pulling this out of nowhere. But go ahead. Sorry. But no, anybody can say that, though. In any time period you're playing, you're kind of just boxed into the meta that you're playing in. So in, in Paris's time frame, everyone was playing Faust. He just happened to be the guy that won with it. 
when Dan was playing, a lot of people were playing Unimind. He just happened to be the guy that won with it. Same thing as like Howard. When Howard won Worlds, he won with what? Goblin King? Yeah. Like, but he, he was playing it at a point value that most people weren't playing him at. Exactly, which is what I think caught people off guard. But again, he's known as always oh, the guy who played, you know, um Goblin King with, you know, Mercury and everything like that. And people were playing the, you know, the pin pocket tank and stuff like that. So uh, just just to point out what people are playing and be like, oh, he's just a guy who played that. Well, yeah, well, everyone was playing that at that time. I think right now is probably, and I've said it before, is probably one of the better metas that we've seen. Just for the fact that you have, like you said, you have Tyler Spees playing Whales. You have Starro builds. You have Lockjaw builds. You have Alpha Strike teams. You've got Gotham City Underworld. You have Gotham City. There's a lot of teams out there that uh, you just tweak a little bit and you play them. And they can't. You have full point Goblin King winning stuff, uh, even after being watch listed. So you have a lot of options out there. And yeah, people are going to say, "Well, you had the same ability with all the resources." Well, we phased that out. We've kind of rotated into playing with some ID cards and some sideline active stuff and shifting focus. Because I mean, Deadpool is still a thing. Deadpool shifting focus on an X Men team is still a thing. You have multiple X-Men teams that you can play with the Blackbird, without the Blackbird, Lila right. Chaney. So there's a lot of different variations of stuff you can still see. So, I mean, to, just to kind of like paint these guys into a corner and be like, oh, they're just the guy who played that. Yeah, well, everyone had to. If you wanted to stay in the top eight, you kind of had to play certain things. And we're seeing that now, too. A lot of people are – you have to you have to play some sort of uh, – undying tech you have to play a lockjaw or haha ha joker just so you can know that you're not going to give up those points in your game so that i i would say is like the the player base development towards lockjaw and haha ha joker is an interesting development and for a couple of reasons number one it's our the point bank of unimind is gone away because all of his powers could be outwitted because of the new outwit rules if he uses perplex. So Unimind is not a safe point bank anymore. No. Okay, like he like he used to. So so th- then you you have to ask what is. Well, with you know, then it's like, well, all right, it, it was Joker. But then when Joker got watch listed and changed, people were like, uh, you know, if I roll a three, and I sorry, if I roll and and I click down three clicks. I'm easily possibly going to give up points. Mm-hmm. I can't be crazy, stupid, aggressive with Joker like I was before. So uh, I'm not going to play him. And also, I can't mastermind to him making, you know, my figures immortal. OK, I think I'm not going to play him. And you see a handful of people still play him. And even then, it's the same. I'll give, you know, same thing of give Joker Blaze Claw's fangs and throw him out there or give him uh well when the weapon drop was legal give him the weapon drop and then everybody's talking about exospecs and like oh give him exospecs it's pretty much just you're doing the same thing you did with the uh with the weapon drop functionally exactly yeah but the the undying team i think the really our game would be a lot different if lockjaw didn't exist because lockjaw is a Pick a power point bank at an efficient enough cost to call in most of the decent IDs. Absolutely. And and that staple alone has made him, in my opinion, um, one of the most annoying figures that I, I, I don't see a way of fixing him just because of the way he's designed. Uh, you You can't say, like, pick a power, turn to that click and if the power that you pick is on that dial you also get uh, a plus one but you have to pick a power that lockjaw could, has on his dial yeah like that's the only way i see fixing him because other than that being able to pick all the other things that he doesn't have it it, it just makes him too much of a utility he he is the better parts of the survivability of Super Scroll without the, any of the downsides. And I know some people would be like, oh, you speaking the, the speaking the, them lies, Dark Logos. But but really, if you if you break it down, the, what was the biggest problem with Super Scroll? Super Scroll could not die on, against a standard team because of the uh, zombification to the Z-Virus tokens. Yeah. And you had to pulse wave him to kill him. Well, 
guess what? Lockjaw's immune to that crap. So you still have tokens that you have to knock down and tokens he can put back on himself. There is, and you and you have pick a power. Now, note, you can't pick, uh, easily pick some broken combos, but Lockjaw has all of the broken combos in his slots. He has all the broken combos in his slots. So, it, you know, the only one he doesn't have is like Blaze Claw's Fangs and like Flurry Blades. I think that's the only one he doesn't have. So, I, I, I do think if you do take Lockjaw out the the game, does the game collapse in a lot? Yes, because I think Lockjaw is propping up most of the teams. Uh, but does it does is it propping up players? And that's where I'm like 90% no, 10% yes. And I'm not calling out any names of who's getting propped out, propped up by Lockjaw, but I, I do think that Lockjaw is a figure that has helped make people more famous than less famous, if you if you catch what I mean. I mean, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying. He's just kind of, he's one of those figures that you don't, you don't necessarily have to, like, practice with a lot. Because you don't have to worry about him dying a whole lot. So you don't have to, like, you know, you don't have to really sit there and be like, all right, cool, I have to, like, really figure out how to finesse him. He's not really a finesse figure. You just, all right, I'm going to pick whatever support power that I need on him for the time being. And I'm just going to go out there and have him tie up some stuff and be a call-in battery. And then once I start, you know, maybe losing some tokens, okay, now maybe I have to think a little more with him. But again, though, too, he's also one of those figures that if played against somebody who has the right combos and can play it smart, you can get Lockjaw off the map with one bad roll. If someone rolls a six and they have an action token and you just in-cap him, he's gone. He pushes onto the KO slot and he's gone without even moving a token from him. So there are some ways around uh, having a Lockjaw out there. You just hope, you just have to hope. Even I think they even gets on, like, click five. If you have two in-caps and he's got a token, you can push him twice and get him, I think, off the map as well. So there are options, but again, you have to have all the stars aligned for somebody to roll six with them and then be able to get into position to to try and in cap them to get him out of there. But yeah, he's, he's he, again, he's like you said, he's a point bank. He's 75 points. He's almost a third of your build um, in a 300 point team. And he basically can call in anything you want. That's right. pretty good right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, all right, let's actually talk about the list itself since we've talked about our, our people. So Dan being number one is understandable. Um, now the bracket numbers next to them, I don't get what that's about. Uh, where it's, it gives you a total point then the bracket points. The bracket points, I think, is telling you how many – because in the college football world, the, the in parentheses – uh, number is how many people on the list voted number one for him. Okay. So I think Dan was 10. So 10 people out of the 18 polled actually voted for Dan to be number one. One. Okay. All right. And so then two people voted for PJ to be number one. Uh, and of course I hit a random button and everything scrolls down. Uh, all right. So two people voted for PJ to be number one. Four people voted for Isaac to be number one. Which is interesting. One for uh, Tom Kerr, of course. I am the one vote for George Masu, uh, but I, I do find it interesting that you can see who thought the actual like top top players are. So yep. the the deviation from their slots is really not that great when when you look at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, so PJ's number two. Uh, Isaac is number three, Easton being number four, which I think that's good. He, I don't feel like he set the the scene on fire this year as much, but I think Lucky Dice Cafe was the family business focus, so I, I give him a pass. Uh, Tom Kerr, I just think he Tom got a ton of respect from people after Rocktober, so that's why I feel Tom Kerr's up there. Number well, especially five. performing with the same performing with something that nobody else really was playing too much right for a thing yes but he was playing an all gotham city team which was you know not not thought that could survive and he did a damn good job with it job so of it yeah props for that yeah he had tricks for days 
then Lane Miller's number six. Uh, that's high. I get it. Uh, it's a little high. I thought he would be like maybe between eight to eight to 15. But again, that was on my list. So a lot more people are giving shout outs to Lane. So maybe I have some more to consider. So I, I'll, I'll be man enough to admit that. George coming in at number seven. Uh, there's that. Uh, with some of the arguments that I've seen, people are like, George hasn't really done nothing but U.S. Nats. I mean, uh, rock Nats. And I'm like, no, George has done other events. It's just... I think people are not paying attention to those results. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, George isn't, you know, old man time, you know, that sort of pops up, you know, scrapes the cobwebs off of the gold plays hero clicks and then goes back to, you know, his slumber. You know, that's that's not how it goes. Uh, Dustin Cedars, I, I do believe he is about at the right spot. Uh, Dustin Cedars has taken out multiple high level people mm -hmm. in events and anybody was like well there goes hippie southern jesus dustin <laughs> cedars uh that you know he just got lucky like no i've seen this guy this guy has run through like almost everybody in my team like and and beat them so i i can't say like oh well, you know dustin cedars is just a lucky player no like he's legit. Uh, Matty G is number nine, and and again, I gotta say this: everybody but Lane that's in front of him has titles. Every everybody that's in front of him except Lane has titles, and I think that's that's a really big thing to show, in, in my opinion, that it's fair. Uh, because Matt is a really good player. He plays a lot of events, mm -hmm. but and he wins a lot of events, too. But when it comes down to some of the bigger events, I, I don't feel like Matt is at a bottleneck. I think, and I've said this to him personally, if Matt practiced, he would he would be in the potential running for the go. And I, I don't I don't say that lightly. No. I think he's too low at nine. I think he should have been higher. And that's just my opinion. I, I, yeah. We, we talk consistency. And, again, there, there are, you, can, uh, you can take some of these people and, and interchange them on the list, and it, it doesn't matter. I, I think that, I think, in my opinion, Matty G should have been higher. I had him six. Yeah. I think, again, consistency. I had George at 11. Because again, yeah, he won the Rock the Rock Nats for US, and he does you know he won an event I think for Majestics. Uh, I think no, actually I think that was the the one he won for Majestics. But other than that, I mean, yeah, he still plays and everything, and he shows up. He went to US Nationals and stuff. And again, if you go off like US Nationals for WizKids, I think Matty G was in the top four in that event, top eight in that event. Uh, I think top four. Okay. I, I yeah, I just I think it's top four. George didn't make the cut. Neither did PJ. I don't think he made the right. cut. Either. No, PJ didn't make the cut either. So if you're going off just consistency, I think Matt has a legit reason to to kind of feel, uh, I guess, a little snubbed, where he can he can point to it and be like, I consistent like yeah, he hasn't won he hasn't won a big event yet, but he consistently is always knocking on the door. And I think yeah. that's why Lane finished up there too. Again, hasn't won a big event yet. But again, he can sit there and point to events and say, I'm always consistently in that top four. I'm always consistently in that top eight. I'm knocking on the door. So I think that's kind of where Matt is probably like, yeah, I didn't go to U.S. Nats or for Rock all the way on the West Coast. But I went to the WizKids one and I made the cut and I made top four. So I can understand why he would uh, maybe – feel like he deserves to be higher in my opinion i put him at six so i think he i i thought he did deserve to be higher yeah all right so next up is adam freeman and adam freeman i feel is like the savant that that just sort of dances with the game and says hey i just show up and do well uh and, and we were talking about this uh at rocktober 
there is no way that anyone can recruit Adam Friedman because I don't think there's anything any team can offer Adam Friedman that he can't produce on his own without being on the team. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is Adam Friedman can functionally be your greatest asset or biggest disruptor. Like if you talk to him, he's an open book. He'll tell you all the stuff that you want to know. But at the same time, you compete against him. You know that it's serious. Like I, I internally in my hero clicks history, I have two uh, people that have been like my biggest competitors, uh, never Baines in my side, but, but more of my internal rivals. Uh, number one was Goku. And number two is Adam Friedman. <laughs> like the first Tulsa rock we played in the finals uh, and several other events. Like I've played to him and lost to him. And so I keep saying to myself, like, I'm a half step of a half step away from catching Adam Friedman, you know. Uh, but, you know, he's not the same ghost like uh, Goku was because I had to deal with Goku a lot. I dealt with Adam only on the big national scene stuff. But I, I feel like Adam is also one of those people that could he be placed higher? Yes. Uh, is he placed about appropriately? Yes. If we're definitely looking at not an all-time list and we're looking at like how everybody performed, because Adam what made what top eight at Rocktober or top four? Um, I think it was top eight. Yeah. So he he was doing well. Uh, so I I think there I think there's something to be said for Adam Friedman's you know creativity and and just understanding of the game. So I think he's he's in a he could be hired, but I also think he's in the right place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ed Berkowitz, uh, yes, because again, I had him higher on my list, but I I also can see how some people that would would put him lower mainly because the East Coast doesn't hold as many events as many events and it's really not reported on as much and i think that's primarily the east coast fault uh i'm i'm not like damn i i, I think that's the east coast fault now now bear with me there's no one coming from the east coast being like yo click stall uh yo starring over podcast uh you know two clicks from ko majestics this is what's popping off boom 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 we having these events go on you better fear pusheen buddy okay that it's it's not going down like that and again ed's in that area so is isaac so the only really measure of most of the east coast guys on the national scene are whatever wkos that they do which in reality kenji and bradley are running most of those OK, so that takes those off the table, those two mm -hmm. off the table and a lot of those events. And then, you know, there's really not much else. So even if you said they weren't doing rock, they were just doing their own thing, sort of like what Pat's doing, that would be fine. It would give us a basis to say, look, these are the competitions that are going down there. This is why you deserve to be noticed. This is what's up. This is what they're building. This is what they're thinking about. But because there isn't this interaction with everybody else, and I'm not saying it's snobbery or elitism, please don't read into what I'm saying. But because there isn't this interaction, a lot of the Midwest and Southern and even West Coast underestimate the East Coast cats. And I think that's one of the main reasons why, like, Kenji is so low on this list, you know, and it but but okay what are do you, you you got some you got some clap back for me that's fair so so <laughs> what what's your thoughts on my statement there homie and what is it did you just say like it's not about you know being the loudest it's just about the biggest you know carrying the biggest stick or whatever like these guys they don't need to they don't i'm the biggest mouth in the east coast and i'll be the first person to tell you that and i haven't won nothing <laughs> i'll be the first person to tell you that i haven't won anything but I think that's just because of the fact that they don't have to. They just let their titles speak for themselves. I mean, Kenji is, what, a two-time national champion, one-time national champion? Uh, Abdul just plays second. 
Isaacs won uh, U.S. Nationals this year. He's won a Rocktober. Uh, Ed has won Rocktober in many events. Scott has won. I, I honestly, and yeah, they they run. I think they run events twice a week. And they're and other than that, they're they're on roll twenty and and they're playing stuff. And I think this is because that's not their personalities. Their personalities aren't to to get out there and to. I mean, they they post a lot. If you look at all the threads and stuff like that, when people ask about like figures and things like that you see guys like uh brian galley and tim and uh kenji or abdul or brad or antonio or a lot of these guys uh talking about stuff or me for that matter talking about stuff so we're always in the conversation i I need to get hooked up to the secret chat because i've i haven't i and i and i i'll say this like i haven't fully abused the facebook information network You know, but I do think the Facebook elements do sort of keep you isolated if you're not in one of the like in a a general community chat or if you're not in uh, a podcast chat like you you have to be on one of those two situations or have somebody make a a really good group with all those names inside talking. Um, And even then, if you have like a little messenger group, it's really just stuck in between those people. But. Okay, that's fair. Their performance speaks for them, so they don't have to speak up, you know, about that. But at, I would say at the same time, I don't think if that's the case, then they can't complain when they're ranked low, because I would make the because argument they don't talk enough? that what? there's not what? enough. Actually, there's championships then click stuff. And no, 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 no. But this is what, this is what have you done? This is like Eddie Murphy Raw. What have you done for me lately? It's what it's not not overall. It's what have you done for me lately? And and eventually, like that's the problem. Like when when Shots Fire was talking about like best teams, I was one of the full few people that said Pusheen. But again, I called, I called that Pusheen would be have three or four guys in the top at uh, the East Coast. I was the only person that said that there would be at least two to three guys from the East Coast or Pusheen in the top eight or 16 at Nationals. Nobody else said anything about them. You had Abdul, Kenji, and Isaac win the entire thing. And nobody said a peep about any of them when they were talking about Nationals. It was PJ <laughs> Bolin, Easton Brock. It was a lot of the, just the household names. And I was like, there's no love for Pusheen or the East Coast here. And then they went out and represented. No, and, and, and I, like I said, is I when we you bring it up household names, and when it comes down to that interaction, outside of Isaac, there aren't any really household names. Like if you are familiar with you know some of the older national tournaments, you'll remember Kenji. Okay, Thank if you, you go to these here. tournaments, you'll you've encountered Kenji. You've encountered I've seen Abdul for years. Okay, and Kenji won last year though. Not not U.S. Nats. Was he win Canadian Nats? He still he probably won, won Canadian, Canadian Nats. Go look at his Phantasm figure in the Batman the Animated Series. His championship figure is right there for you. 2017. Okay, so he's probably Canadian national champion. But again, still winning. Yeah, he's Canadian national champion. No, 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 no. I, and again, like I said, is I'm not. I'm definitely the last dude to be casting shade on them. Okay, no, no, no. I'm saying you wanted an answer. Like these guys no. are winning. They are they are winning. I, they I like I said is I don't think a thousand things or do live videos like me to get anybody to to listen. Right. Like, I, I unfortunately, hey, dude, you are the uh, I guess you're the East Coast podcaster. You're you're the East Coast po- East Coast podcaster. I I guess because I, I mean and I think that's one thing that's sort of necessary to get some of the reporting out is all right who is covering that. And when we look back at the community, okay, well, your Aries is covering the East Coast, so or at least the Northeast. So if Aries haven't heard from you or heard of you, then you probably ain't doing much. So like that's a litmus test, I would say, is are you validated in the, in the East Coast? It's like is Aries talking about you? So that's that's something that we can we can talk about. All right, we we've already talked about Tyler Spees. Scott Crampton comes out, plays Hero Clicks, and then he does go and old man winter it so you know he he, he father times that sucker a lot uh <laughs> and, and he admits it he's like i go play i go play fancy football and then i come back and play clicks like after once fancy football starts i don't care 
Uh, I don't know how that's going to change uh, because we have the world championships, you know, in, you know, the dead center of football Absolutely. season. But if I'm going to say this as a longtime fan of Scott and then a longtime follower of clicks, we have seen Scott do well caring about clicks half the year. Do we want to face Scott caring about caring about clicks three fourths of the year? Yes. And I, I'm saying that as a, as a res- person that respects him and as a competitor. As a person that respects him, I feel like the beast is waking up. Absolutely. As a person that has to play him, I'm like, can we get this man more football? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like. Can we get this man more football? Because truthfully, Rocktober, that should have started, you know, the hibernation, you know, sequence of Scott Crampton, but it's not. And that's what I think is going to be is really the upset is that if we do this three months from now, I don't think anyone can sleep on Scott because I think he's going to go into world championships and he's going to say, what's my name? And then he's, and then we're gonna be like uh, Scott Crampton. He's like, yes, that's right. Again, what's my name? And, and and he's gonna make people sort of wake the hell up as he smacks them over their face with his clicks bag. So uh, yeah. So we talked about Kenji. All right, dude at the bottom, J Major. Okay. This is is the the the, the what I wanted to see. Now, again, I put Jay as my bottom pick, as one of my bottom picks, Mm -hmm. because I do believe that if someone was telling me, give me a top 15 snapshot right now, I do think if you sleep on Jay Major, then you have a problem. You look at his performance at Rocktober. You look at his performance, him and his son at Rocktober. You Mm -hmm. look at uh, pretty much him being one of the solidifying factors of CWO. He's he's probably yeah, he he and his son are probably the two top players in CWO in terms of skill set. So if I even though he may not be the captain or head organizer of it, if some if 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 I look at CWO, Jay is the face. Jay is the face that I see uh more than than Randy Carter. Uh and I I would also say that a person could say it's like, oh, Jay plays Shredders. That's why he's on the list. And I could say, yes, Jay does play Shredders, but Jay has been playing for a long time and he has played a lot of other things. So I I, I can't just say he's a Shredder <laughs> player, okay, because he hasn't always been a Shredder player. Yeah. So I, I think there there's there's a catch-22 with Jay. Well, he just won a and, tournament, too, without playing Shredders. Right, right. But there's a catch-22 with Jay, and my only catch-22 is, is like, you you have the main shop during Origins. I don't, like, I love this as a hobby. I don't want this to affect your, your bottom line. And he says he, he gets it balanced and all that, then it's all good. Yeah. This this all good. That was my only, like, reservation. I'm like, yo, man, I don't, you got family, you got responsibilities, you know, you're pretty much like a cornerstone for everybody's, oh, my gosh, I left it at the hotel, you know, moments when they're at Origins. Like, you're buying from Jay nine times out of ten. Mm-hmm. So so I think some people look at him like a shopkeeper NPC in a game, when in actuality, you know, he's he's a main party member. So, yeah, like, definitely don't don't sleep on, on Jay Major. He and Jalen, they're both really good players. Uh, and, and have been. So uh, Clicks World Order is a team that I feel is a lot a lot more enriched by having those two on there. Um, do you, what, what, what's your comments? Because we sort of I ran through the bottom five real fast. No, like I said, like the, the bottom, like my honorable mentions and my bottom five, you could flip flop them just for the fact that they're they're all they all have stuff going on. Or they all have, uh, like you said, there's kind of question marks about them, or they're they're just starting to get stride. Uh, again, Mike, like I said, I had Mike at 15. I could have easily taken him out and put Jay at 15, or mm-hmm. 14 and put Paris at 15. 
the bottom half, the, the, the bottom five after the top ten is a bunch of players that are doing really well and with a couple more diverse builds or a couple more uh, wins or something like that could easily crack top ten, could easily uh, bump the whole entire list around. <laughs> right. And I – and this is the one thing I'm I'm sort of happy about with Roll20 becoming popular because of Patrick and also because of Rock. Roll20 has allowed more people to play more games outside their area and get access to more different types of teams than any other point in time in Heroclix history. Because you've always had to wait for someone to put up a list on Realms before you could even think about it, even if you wanted to play test it. Mm-hmm. Like now you could just get a pickup game and play whatever on the, the rock online discord. Uh, I was actually surprised how many like people putting, you know, looking for game, uh, you know, notifications out on that discord. So when you look at all of that, it makes you sort of sit back and say, all right, why it, it, we look at the bottom names, the, the honorable mentions, why are they even honorable mentions? And, and I would say, hey, because of Roll20. And I would say some people at the bottom, why are they disruptive? Uh, and we're, we can sort of say, like, they could have potential to move up because of Roll20. Now, if you take Roll20 out of this, I'm going to tell you, number one, no one knows who not no one knows who Lane is. No one knows who Tyler is. Uh, and, yeah, no one knows who Lane and Tyler are. Okay. And that that really sort of to me solidifies my point is that Tyler got famous from Roll20, covering Roll20 and playing on Roll20 being streamed. And so did Lane from doing the streaming well, um, and, I mean, like, and in their results. HIE online with me because we were doing online events before Roll20 even came out with the HIE online events. And that was just it was just a lot more moving parts. We had to do Google Hangouts. We had to make sure everyone had maps. Uh, we had to have uh, a judge, which was usually uh, put together by Omar Camacho. He had all the judges and stuff. And so we were doing online stuff probably, I think, for uh, at least a year or two. And then Roll20 uh, was talked about for rock play and things like that. And after Roll20 came out, HIE Online kind of just went away because Roll20, it was just logistically so much easier. Uh, than trying to get people to get a time, have the maps, have video equipment, to get a judge to sit there for a two-hour match because you had to make sure that everyone was clicking stuff properly and look at dice rolls. So uh, Lane Lane was doing all that stuff with us before Roll Twenty. Just Roll Twenty, it was just it's it's just so it's so much easier and so much more hands-on with those guys. And they I I can't I can't knock them. They did a damn good job with roll 20 i'm on roll 20 and i i thought the idea was like this is going to be bad it's going to be such a pain and now i'm i mean i'm playing two and three nights a week with with uh people all the time so yeah roll 20 is great yeah and i i will be honest it's like i've done a bunch of practice games trying to get ready for worlds and roll 20 has just made my life so much easier because I, I can say, like, my old school way of practicing is you go, you get the map out, and then you put the figures mm-hmm. around, and you look, and then you're like, well, but I don't own that map. So you're stuck staring at the screen, trying to mentally imagine where you would put your figures and stuff, and writing down, you know, your your notifications of, like, well, I moved from A5 into B17 with mm-hmm. a hypersonic speed attack, and then I shoot him and, you know... It, it, all that stuff, you know, you know, it, it's it's a lot easier because I, I also have to, you know, shout out to Clay because Clay pretty much had his little map site where he has all the rock maps and all the WizKids maps. Oh, uh, that site's oh yeah, that site's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 rainbow magic, you know, with unicorns and horseshoes and blue moons, you know, and you might even see a lucky charm. You know, I'm mean, sorry, you might even see a a, a leprechaun, you know. Who do try to steal PJ Bowler's beard, but then got beat up because PJ's a grown man, you know. Uh, that that sort of went off the rails there. So uh, anyway, a little bit. 
<laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. It's but, your, I wasn't going to tell you not to. Uh, I, I rabbit trail myself. I'm just visiting. <laughs> yeah, I, I rabbit trail myself. That's how it goes. But uh, but yeah, I, I I think Roll20 comes up and it's the main disruptor. I also think it's the main technology that we need. Uh, the only problem that I feel that Roll20 creates is now we start to separate natural talent from games under the belt. And we're, we're going to start seeing a separation. And so some people that had high amounts of natural talent will start going and, and suffer against people that have high amounts of games under their belt. And it's sort of like what Patrick says. It's like practice trumps theory 100 percent of the time. Absolutely. And high and, and, and high skill will get you so far. But if I've seen the scenario 15 times that if I move out with, you know, my my Jean Grey and I aggressively place her, she's going to get nuked. But if I moderately put her out there where she's not too aggressive, but mm -hmm. forward enough, then she survives 75 percent of the time. And if my opponent goes for them, they're overextended, you know, 60 to 70 percent of the time. Things like that uh, are are elements that you only have when you play a lot of games. Okay. And I also told my guys this is like I asked them like a year and a half ago, you know, should I do like a little module thing and talk about the benefits of chess? And they were like, yeah, that's a that would be a good idea. One of the minute things like here. Here's top secret stuff, top secret stuff that I've never said before. There's one minor thing when you start talking about the history of chess in in the modern era, which I would say is 2000 forward. Mm -hmm. There are two major developments that's pushed chess forward. Uh, number one is uh, computer AI assistance. And number two is online chess. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Russian grandmasters and the American grandmasters used to do play deep chess. So. Mm -hmm. Deep chess is like logic puzzles where you would have like your chess magazine. It's like how many moves to checkmate type things. Yeah. And they would keep rewinding back moves. OK, uh, the reason why India, South Africa and a lot of uh, like uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, all of those other countries started to come on the scene is because of wide chess and wide chess was uh I play uh, in a day 200 or 300 games. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have my notation. I look, I, I spend eight to 10 hours playing. I spend two hours reviewing. And then the next day I play another uh, 100 to 200 games. And they start to realize is that while deep chess gave you uh, a lot of good understanding on specific positioning and, and what to do in very specific scenarios, uh, why chess just prepared you for more situations. You, you already knew what the more likely the outcome was going to be because you played so many games. Exactly. So I, I and that's, that's where I'm seeing it's like, yeah, this is only like, this list is going to change and it's going to get a lot worse. Uh, let me rephrase that. It's going to get a lot worse for people who think they're going to stay at the top because the wide hero clicks world is coming. And we we're thinking a lot right now, even in the podcast in uh, deep hero clicks. Like I play this matchup. This is my opener. That if I roll this much, this is how this game should roll out versus, OK, I play this matchup 15 times. I've lost three and I've won the rest. So I don't even need to think about odds. I don't need to think about, you know, I need to think, be aware of general positioning and stuff, but I don't have to go deep because I know just surface level knowledge of this matchup means that I win. The only way that I see us going into deep clicks is if there is a problem that the game presents itself that requires absolute pinpoint, you know, precision placement. Like, I don't know if you played during this time, uh, the whole uh, the unspoken problem with the, mm -hmm. the bat belt. Yep. 
Yeah, it was uh, you would play the unspoken to beat Century and Void when Century and Void was a big thing. And so, yeah, so there was you had to win map and there was one map that you had to specifically land on. And then you need to move from specifically one set of your uh, one space in your starting zone to another and then fully move up again and be uh, by your opponent on turn two uh, and be specifically on the right level of elevation. So Unspoken's ability goes off and then proceed to handcuff them so that they can do absolutely zero for the rest of the game. That's that is what I would call deep clicks versus like, oh, I play unspoken versus unseen unspoken wins. Yeah, but I think it's also we're at a point, too, in, in hero clicks where not necessarily one team is always going to win. We don't have we don't have those kinds of situations now like we have with Faust and things like that, where you can go into a matchup and just completely or what was the other one there? There was the uh, the Loki combo or something like that that could infinitely go off and completely just ruin a game. Um, so I, I don't think we're ever going to hopefully run into a situation like that where we have to. But, I mean, what it boils down to, this is a game where you roll dice. It's all about chance. You can play 200 times and play the same thing over and over, and you can know the matchup ins and outs. But if your dice don't cooperate, like, you're, you're not going to get the optimal um uh, outcome that you want just for the fact that it still is a game of chance sure a lot of a lot of preparation goes into it and uh i mentioned this a couple i think a couple weeks ago with uh mr stringer who came over from magic and thought he could just net deck a bunch of hero clicks that were <laughs> net hero clicks, and homeboy got his face blown off because he didn't realize oh okay i actually have to know battle strategy i actually have to position stuff i actually have to oh wow I can't just drop cards out that combo themselves and I don't have to do nothing. You know, and, Zeus is the most broken figure in the game right now. <laughs> and yeah, just and just gone. He was just he <laughs> came out for like a, a, a hard month and poof, he's gone just because it's not our game is is still about chance and still about things like that, but it's also is a, a lot of battle strategy that goes into place and you can misplay something on turn 3 and still come out on top because the other person couldn't couldn't um capitalize because their dice sucked or whatever the case may be or maybe they misplayed there's a lot of different variables that go into the game and i don't think people take into consideration and right. like you were saying before too there's a lot of guys that have raw talent and a lot of guys that that put in the work and i mean you can look at I, i'm a big sports guy so you can even look at like uh sports figures who have done that stuff michael vick is the first person that stands out the guy had all the talent in the world all the raw talent in the world but from all the stuff that i've uh I, as i listen to podcasts and i do research and i look at stuff the guy didn't watch film ever he never tried to perfect his craft he never tried to go the extra mile in it he never tried hard he just wanted his natural talent to carry him and it never did now you have other guys out there who probably don't have uh, a quarter of the natural raw talent that Michael Vick had, but they're so much better because they put in the work and they watch the film. Like, I mean, Peyton Manning, Peyton Manning was a great quarterback, but it was also because that guy put in the work. He watched the film. He was, he, he was almost a coach on the field, just recognizing defenses and breaking them down and knowing how to exploit them. Michael Vick just wanted his raw talents to carry him, and it didn't work that way. So it's it's going to be the same thing with Heroclix, too. You can have all the raw talent in the world, but if you're not putting in the the work for it, it's just not going to work out for you. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I agree with that, and I've coached that, and I've said, you know, constantly on my team, it's like, if you, did, if you got a lack of practice, it wasn't – because of of any other reason but yourself because i'm always down to practice you know so th there's that so I, I mean but overall i feel that what like extrapolating from this conversation is is that this list is pretty good if it, if this happens quarterly we're going to see new names because i i, I feel like this 
we, you got some time until let's just say we do this again. Uh, let's just say going into March. Let's just say March is the next time uh, people are polled. So end of February is posted the beginning of March. Okay, we're still, you know, reeling from worlds. Okay, but I would argue it's like once you get past U.S. Nats and you go into that summer, I think the summertime is when things actually should start shaking up. I also do think there is another element that should go down. There should be like maybe a point system where if if, if we can get get it reported and we say rock only, not WKOs. Mm-hmm. OK, so we say rock only. This is how many rocks you've gone to. This is your placement. So you get certain points per placement and uh, and you get it divided by tournaments. So let's just say I go uh, to four rocks. OK, and I top eight them all and I, I win one and I get, let's just say, f- fourth place at the rest of them. OK, enter in the points and then put in my ratio and say, boom, OK, this is Edward's score. OK, so like take Matt, Matt, uh, Matty G. If Matty G goes to, let's just say, 10 rocks because it's Matty G and he plays, he wins five of them and he places top four in the rest of them. His average should beat out my average and it should be weighted that like, look, here's these points over how many matches, how many tournaments. What I don't want to have happen is look at me. <clears throat> my name is Billy Joe Bob. I won three rocks, but I've went to seven and I only placed in those three rocks that I won. I don't feel like you should be your I, I don't feel like you should be mentioned. You know, you, you sort of see where I'm going. Yeah. Like, you know, like if, if you were placing and breaking you know, multitudes of times. I'll even say like, hey, man, you have a bad tournament. You didn't break, you know, like one every four or one every five. You didn't break. OK, cool. I'm down with that. But uh, I, I think there maybe should be some points that we we throw out there, mainly so that we have a statistical list. Verse and then we also have like an opinion list. And so we can we can put up both. And by having both, we can say like, well, we can look at the statistics because you can say like, hey, Paris had family stuff go down. So he wasn't there. So I can balance that. And I still think he's better than this other person. So in my list, I put him at number, you know, 12 or something like that. Uh, But I, I do think when you start talking the top five, there is more opinion you can get can throw in there because the points in the stacks start to become a lot more similar. Well, so you, you would just hope that people who are on this list that are actually making the votes would take all this into consideration when they look at it. You know what I mean? The reason that that Lane put this 18 to 20 people together was the fact that it was people from all over the country, from all different teams. And right. They give their own biased opinion, and, and and again, that's why. And I sat there and gave you mine, my top fifteen, and I even told Lane, like, yeah, I probably won't throw mine out there, but I have no shame putting it out there, and I have a reason that every single person is in their spots, and and that's all backed up by wins or losses or consistency, or so on and so forth. I mean. I'm not going to ask anybody else their lists or anything like that, but I mean, can other people say the same or do they kind of just like, eh, I, you know, I like them. I've played against them. I throw them up there. Right. And, and I'm, and the main reason I sort of throw out like my methodology and the way I was thinking about it is I would like to see other people's way of looking at and thinking about it so that we can analyze it better. So uh, like if someone says, Hey, why is, you know, clicks off the number one team right now and four points is number two and Phoenix Nets number three or whatever, you know, uh, I could come back and say, well, if you look at these statistics right here, 
in this polling right here and then win losses and tournament placements this is why like the top five members get aggregated and then boom this is your result like i i would love to see something like that because then it would be like oh okay that's why this these are top teams versus hey two people on the podcast voted for this because you know they like that team or they seen you know there's a tournaments that they seen these people perform at that you know you and i may or may not have been able to see you know similar performances you know so so yeah uh anyway uh i like to thank aries for coming on the show uh do you have any specific shout outs or or uh you know shilling that you would like to do uh i just want to uh shout out the pushing guys man i mean i've been uh i've been on roll 20 with them a lot uh play testing um working hard to try and get this world's in i want to uh I want to also just kind of point out that Lane's message, uh, his post has just gone completely uh, out there. Howard Brock, quote, I am sad to see the lack of West Coast players on the list. Adam Friedman, quote, I'm sad to see the lack of West Coast players doing well at major events. Hashtag oh, burn. Hashtag burn. Matty G, quote, they can't win their own events LMAO, PJ, Daniel, and George, all from the Midwest, show up and stomp them all. This is going to deteriorate fast. <laughs> and this is going to be, uh, it's going to be an interesting world when all these guys get to get, I mean, just, this is, this is a great time to be a Heroclix player with just the amount of passion. And that's what this is, man. People like, there's a fine line between like being disrespectful and having passion and talking smack and this is just this is i think this is great for the game we need rivalries everyone's too everyone's too like you know pat you on the butt give you a participation trophy hey thanks for being out we need people like we need this kind of like legit passion to be like nah the hell with you i I think i'm better than you i think i can beat you and this is this is what you're seeing right now i i agree with you and i i will definitely say uh rocktober has opened my eyes to some things and i i I, i'm trying to get the fangs out uh you know i'm I'm trying to get the fangs out i'm not trying to be you know you know super happy fun guy edward dark logo shelton i'm trying to you know be like hold up wait what just happened why am i dead edward shelton (laughs) you know it's like i just got systematically disassembled by him i could what what just happened so uh yeah, I'm trying to 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 get ready for worlds too. But I, I, I do agree with you on on this one element and as I wrap up and do all the, the things at the end of the show. I think we have replaced the fact that we can be friendly with each other to feeling that we all fall into the category of friends. And I I think that's a, a very important line that I think a lot of people don't understand. Um, what I call a friend and what you call a friend can be vastly different. <laughs> okay. I, I call a friend a person that I can be blatantly honest with and they can be blatantly honest with me. Um, and they don't get and, and they don't take offense and I don't take offense to them because I value honesty. Some people aren't like that. No. Some some people want to be propped up or some people just want to be spoken well of. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, some people feel like you should sacrifice your last dime for them because they would do the same for you. So just because folks get along does not mean they're they're your friend. And so I, I think when it's come down to this game at this stage, I think a lot of people feel it's like, well, I'm friendly with Edward or I'm friendly with you know, Bill, I'm friendly with PJ. And it's like, so they're my friends. It's like, no, 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 man. Like there's a point where it's like when the dice have to roll, I'm like, uh, I'm no longer that guy you knew before the game. I'm, you know, captain of the Phoenix Nest, warrior chief priest, you know, Edward Shelton put on the, the freaking Black Panther mask, you know, Phoenix Nest forever. And let, you know, let me watch it burn it down. Uh, and then when it's when it's all done, I, I double tap my chest again. The mask comes off. It's like that was a good game. But, 
that's but, what I'm yeah. about to, man. It's like I, I can be, and I think that's why a lot of people uh, reach out to me and stuff is because you, and you see my live videos and stuff too. I don't hold back, and I'm not gonna hold back. I, I I'm gonna tell you exactly what I feel, uh, and sometimes it's not as politically correct as it should be. <laughs> but I'm gonna tell you exactly where you stand, and if you're being, you know a jerk or or something like that, I'll be the first person to tell you. And yeah, like I'll be friendly with you and stuff like that too. But as soon as we're on a map, I'm I'm I came here, I didn't travel all the way to Philadelphia to make friends and shake hands. I came to smash you. I came to smash you. I came to ruin your day. I came to send you home on Saturday. Yeah. Like I like after that, hey man, best of luck to you. Hopefully I see you around. But I'm hoping I don't see you around. I'm hoping I don't see you at them top eight tables. I'm hoping that I just smash you and I just continue on my path. And afterwards, eh, hey, good good seeing you. But, like, nobody's traveling to these events to, man, I can't wait to see these guys and have a good time. And, and you know, everyone, let me rephrase that, is you go there to have a good time and everything. But, like, you don't go there to be like, man, I can't wait to finish fourth. Hell right. no. Nobody's coming finish. there to be like, I'm going to come to finish fourth. Yeah. Yeah. So like like always, like I, I, I guess this is this is definitely more chat that I needed. Uh and, and I also wanted to have on the show with uh people just saying like, hey, we critique things, it's all good. So uh like always, you can follow me uh on Twitter at startoverpod. It came from outer space and told me, you know, there's a nebula out there that produces diamonds the size of your head but there's no pressure we don't know where how they form probably a planet blew up we don't know if my twitter doesn't know then the universe doesn't know my my twitter knows everything intergalactic and yet it talks to me i don't know why i must be a cool person but uh unlike youtube twitter will tell you when a new show is up and understand when i have cool people like mr aries edge on my show uh youtube doesn't like people that are subscribers, small subscriber bases, and they won't know, let you know even when that bing, that little bell is rung and you have subscribed. So follow me on Twitter. That's more important. Uh, you can email me at startingoverpodcast at gmail.com. That's startingoverpodcast at gmail.com. If you wish to opine, keep it pithy, keep it interesting, keep it uh, 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 awesome, baby. Uh, let me know what your uh, top 10 uh, Heroclix players currently are. Uh, not, not the GOAT, don't don't give don't send me emails about who you think is the goat. I don't, I don't got time for that. Uh, and last but not least, if you would like to donate to the show, you can go to startingoverpodcast.blogspot.com, where my former you know dreams of of writing about this game and love love of it died long ago due to Spiral. I'm not kidding. Spiral killed it. Uh, so, so yeah. So uh, donate to me there. I need a new camera because I can't see Aries' lovely face. And he can't see mine. Ain't nothing lovely about this face, bro. Ain't nothing lovely about this face. Trying to be nice, sir. Trying to be <laughs> nice. All right. Uh, that's it. Like, again, uh, I'd like to thank Aries for being on the show. Thank and like always.